2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 13 this morning. What are you made of? What are you made of? When I was growing up, I was a sissy. I can admit that in elementary. I was literally a sissy. Thank you, Mom, because it was due to her. My mom would tell me, don't fight. Don't fight or punch girls. And if someone picks a fight with you, just walk away and just run. I guess she saw too many fights growing up and she didn't want to see me in fights. And so that's exactly what I did. I did not fight. (laughs) If someone wanted to fight, I took off and I ran home as fast as I could. And so guys would chase me on their bikes, hit me with their bats and sticks, you know, and so forth. But I wouldn't fight. I'd keep running. That's probably why I joined cross country later on down the road. (laughs) I was good at running. Until one day in sixth grade, a police officer uh, happened to be called by my mom to, to talk to me about some boys that were picking on me. And the police officer said to my mom, can I talk to him alone? So she walked into the other room, and there I sat with this police officer, huge white guy. All I can remember was a giant having all the uniform and guns and, you know, baton on the side and so forth, and just, you know, listening to him. And he said, son, you're going to have to learn to fight. (laughs) And I thought, but my mom said not to fight. Okay, I understand that, but if someone picks on you, you need to learn to fight and defend yourself. He says, I give you permission to do so. I mean, he's a police officer, so he gave me permission. And so the next time someone picked a fight with me, I just, I didn't know how to fight, so I just started doing this, you know, hitting like this, and the guy's face turned red, and he cried, and he walked away. And I thought, wow. And because of that, I gained a reputation. I went into junior high, and nobody touched me because they remember that fight in elementary. And from that point on, I grew up. I wasn't a sissy anymore. Well, I never fought again, though, because of that reputation. Now, before you get the wrong idea, though, what are you made of is not speaking of our physical strength. I'm talking spiritually. So forget that whole story. That was just an introduction. I'm talking spiritually. What are you made of spiritually? Spiritually speaking, you know, I I think of the book of Daniel. I think of three Hebrew boys who came into Babylon through the captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. And because they did not follow the culture of that time, Nebuchadnezzar decided through counsel to take these boys and put them through the fire in a sense. And so he takes these boys and he throws them into the fire. And this whole experience, we find out what these three boys are made of, right? These three boys are made of a lot. They are the pinnacle of examples for us, of not wavering of the truth, of trusting in God, of depending on God for all their sufficiency. And what an example that they are. So when I speak of what you are made of, I'm speaking spiritually. How strong are you spiritually? Are you able to withstand the fiery furnace in a sense peter here is dying in this little epistle it's his last words as i've shared before with you i thought about this last night again Uh, i don't know i think as you get older you think about these things more often than, than than before and i thought what would be my last words and i really thought about this and one thing that came to mind was was i would tell my wife first of all and it just, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I would probably tell her I'm sorry. And then I would go down to each of my sons and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And of course, they'd say, sorry for what, Dad? <laughs> well, I'm just sorry for whatever I've done you know, that was wrong, that was an error. Because my heart is not to err, but to be the best godly husband and father that I can be and grandfather now. And so I would probably say, I'm sorry. And that just really moved my heart because that was the spirit of God just directing me at that moment. But what would you say, knowing that you were breathing your last words? His topic here is on world events. His topic is on the world coming to an end. 
And he saw that at his time. He saw the signs that Jesus spoke about. And so Peter's on his dying bed and he said, I need to talk about important things to you. Obviously, the persecution has come. Many have died. And there are a lot of questions going out there in the world today about the return of Christ. And so I need you to understand that he may come, but he may not come. And if he doesn't come, how should you live? How should you live? And there are signs today of his coming in there. The mayor in Houston, you heard that story. It's been going on for several weeks now where she subpoenaed five pastors who were against her as she ran for mayor subpoenaed all their sermons, said, I want to see them all. Uh, got a subpoena, hired some lawyers and so forth. Well, that created a backlash for her. The wording was not done correctly. And so she said, not subpoenas, speeches. I want to see all your speeches. And she thought that would be a little bit better and a little more legal. We have amendment rights to free speech, and she broke those amendment rights. And so what has been happening, because she asked for these speeches, pastors all across this nation have been sending her their speeches. And so now she's got boxes and boxes of speeches there in her office waiting to be read. You know? And I can just imagine some of the sermons that these guys probably <laughs> sent her you know, on being born again, on repenting you know, about Jesus Christ and who he is and so forth. And so... Um, Amazing, but this is what's happening in the world today. I'm, I'm hoping and praying here if the Lord leads me to get a hold of Brad Dacus and have him come out this coming November. I really think that he needs to share with the body here about some of the things that are going on uh, in, in the world today. And so pray for me that I can uh, get a hold of him and ask him to come on out. So <clears throat> last time that we met, we looked at the events in the last days there in verse 10. As Peter writes, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, so we don't know when he's going to come, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. And so he's speaking of the last days, Jesus coming back at an hour and a time that we don't know of. And then he gets into verses 11 through 13. Let's go ahead and read those verses. Therefore... Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements which melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Stop there. This morning's theme, I thought it was cute. Some of you may remember this, some of you may not, but they plump when you cook them. (laughs) You remember that commercial ad for those hot dogs? When you cook them, they plump up. And so what are you made of? What plumps when they cook you (laughs) or when you're being cooked? What kind of person are you knowing that the end is near? That's a good question to ask yourself. If the end is near, what kind of life am I living right now? How effective am I in this world? Am I living the Christian life? Am I walking the way that Jesus wants me to walk? Or am I struggling? Is there sin in my life? Is there something that I'm dealing with? Can I quickly just say this? Stop it. Stop thinking about your sins. Stop thinking about the struggles that you're having. Get busy serving the Lord. And I'll guarantee you that when you start serving the Lord and and start focusing on God, he will take care of the rest of that. It's already taken care of, by the way. He died on the cross for your sins. They're forgiven past, present, and future sins. We forget that. They are forgiven in the future. He knows you're going to sin tomorrow. And when you sin tomorrow, he's already forgiven you for that. The blood is that great. And so stop dwelling on your sin. Stop dwelling on your problems. Start walking for the Lord. Live for him and watch what he does with your situation. I guarantee you, you'll begin to sin less as you serve more. Let's look at this a little bit closer, verse 11. Since or therefore all these things will be dissolved. Now we know he's talking about the earth. He's been talking about this the last few verses, about the earth burning up and the elements being destroyed and so forth. Uh, 3.10 talks about that. And then we get into my first point, the outward living. Outward living. 
what is outward living? It's walking in the spirit. I'm talking about how you live your Christian life, how you walk in this world, what you do with your Christianity, what you do with Jesus. We're to walk in the spirit. What is walking in the spirit? Paul said in Galatians 5, 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in verse 22 says, but the, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the spirit. We are to love. Are you walking in love? Do you love your brethren? Do you love your spouse? Do you really love your spouse? Love covers a multitude of sin, the Bible says. So love your spouse like that. Do you love your children? I would say that most mamas love their children. And dads love their children deeply. They just don't know how to express it because they're men. They don't have that emotional connection as women do. Carried the baby for nine months. There's a connection there. You know, the dad just looked and said, whoa, what's happening to you? You know, oh, and there's the child, you know. There's not a connection. But love, love your neighbor. Joy, do you have joy in life? Not happiness, because happiness deals with your situation, right? And, you know, depending on your situation, depending on what's going on in your life. Yeah, I'm happy. We're having a good day today. I'm a real happy guy. What about those days that you're not having a good day? I'm not too happy today, but you know what? I got joy, joy, joy in my heart. Why? Because I got Jesus. Because I know where I'm going eternally. And this world stinks, and I don't like it, but, you know, God said that I would have these times, and I can have joy in knowing that I have eternal life and peace with him. So there's joy there. Walking in joy, walking in peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Boy, that's a big one, self-control. Walking in self-control. Being a person that's, that, that's con in control of their passions, their desires, that you're able to pull in the reins on those horses that want to just continue to go forth. And Paul says, against such there is no law. Isn't that wonderful? You do this, and there is no law. As Jesus kind of summed it up and says, love God, and then love your neighbor, and you fulfill the commandments. That's simple. And love includes these things. And so that's what I'm talking about, walking in the spirit. The inward man, or the outward man that walks, and it's displayed through his actions and his character. And he goes on and says, What manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and in godliness? The word ought is interesting here in the Greek. It refers to the obligation, including the idea of owing a debt to someone. And so there's an obligation, there's a debt to be paid. And it's not that you're trying to pay this debt off so that you obtain something. It's that you owe God your whole life because of what he has done for you. He has given you eternal life based upon his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross through his blood and his work. That is paid for. Thus you get to go to heaven if you believe in that. And because of that, you owe him your very life. And so you ought to have a desire to repay him for what he's done for you. That's what Peter's saying here. Having a desire, a hunger to be indebted to that individual. I think you'll understand this. When someone does something kind to you, don't you feel indebted to do something kind for them? Uh, sometimes that's, that's kind of birth out of pride, you know, where, where someone says, hey, I'll buy you lunch, and you're like, oh, I don't know. Now I owe him lunch. <laughs> you know, I got to buy him lunch now. Okay, next time I got to remember that this is you know, my turn to buy him lunch, you know. Uh, and we feel indebted that way. And that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about someone pouring so much into you, there's no way you could ever repay them. But you begin to serve and work on that debt. He says, you to be ho in holy conduct in, in godliness. Now, holiness we know means just, just separated to God. And most Christians understand that when we become Christians, we are now separated unto God. Okay, God, I, I want to be used by you. I, I no longer am a part of this world. I'm going to be set apart for your work. That's what he's talking about here. And we're set apart in our conduct and godliness. The New Living Translation says, What holy and godly lives should you live? 
That's the translation. What holy and godly life should you live? The, the sense of Peter's exhortation here is that since all these things will pass away and since you are entering the glorious eternal state, you know your security is there, consider the type of person that you are. If you're a believer and our focus on this world that is passing away, then you're living a wasteful life. Let me say that again. If you are a believer and you are focused on this world, the things of this world, define that, Pastor. What do you mean the things of this world? If your focus is on this world and the things of this world and what you can accumulate, what treasures you can have, what toys you can um, create and so forth, you know, what retirement accounts that will benefit you in the future and you have a yacht and you'll be able to go out into the ocean anytime you want to, those type of things. Your investment is in this world. It's a wasteful life. There, there is no heavenly investment, is what I'm saying. Peter is suggesting that you ought to live a heavenly life. Someone said that you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You ever hear that phrase? And there are some people like that. You, know, you talk to them in almost every word. Praise God, praise Jesus, hallelujah. And you're like, okay, can we have a conversation here? You know, oh yeah, hallelujah, praise God, oh God is good. You know, and you're just like, okay, we can't have a conversation. You're just so way up there, you know, I can't even speak to you down here. And in a sense, that's true. But in reality, I think a lot of us are a little more earthly minded and no heavenly good. How many of us are really earthly minded? We ought to be heavenly minded. We ought to be focused on church. How, how involved are we in church? How involved are we in the community? How involved are we in planting seeds and watering the gospel message? You know, we have an opportunity here to reach out to this community. We did it last year and we took a step of faith, and we thought, let's, let's do it big. Normally, we have a few toys in here. The church comes here because they belong to the church. They love this church. They're connected to this church, and so they bring their little ones and their grandkids, and usually just the church children come here, and it's a great time. We have a great time. We eat lots of candy. You know, we fellowship and laugh and giggle and all those things, but this last year, we thought, let's, let's take a step of faith. Let's put a bunch of booths out there, and let's see what happens. And so we did that. We put, I don't know how many booths out there, all kinds of different games and so forth, and we just thought, I thought, this is not going to work. We're going to have the same people come into this room, and all that's just going to be sitting there empty. But we were blown away having 200 kids. The place was packed. People were all over the place. And we gave out so much candy, each person walked away with a grocery bag because we over ordered in candy it was a blessed time we were able to pass out so many tracks and so many flyers and we're hoping that the same thing happens now here's our dilemma it's not that they're going not going to come my dilemma is who's going to serve because we have a, a a totally different group of people now from last year who's going to serve the booths who's going to get involved see that's what he's talking about being heavenly minded where are you connected what church? How are you active? What are you doing? How are you living? God wants you to be watchful, to be mindful, and to be grateful of the return of Jesus Christ. Paul said this, that the believers are the only people who really know how to live in a temporal world. And that's true. Only believers know how to live in a temporal world. We understand this world's passing away. It will burn up one day. We will die one day, and so we need to hold on to things very lightly, not put our faith and trust in those things. Second Corinthians 4.18, Paul said, We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We look at the eternal things, what God is doing, how he's working in the lives of individuals. We don't see it but he's working. We just had an outreach, 11 weeks, to the community over there at Glen Avon Heritage Park. 11 weeks, every Friday night, and we saw some fruit, but we haven't seen uh, the tip of the iceberg, in a sense, of what God was doing over there, and we probably will not see, but what God did over there will be eternal, and we put our faith and trust that God did a work in the lives of those that live in that area there. Will it impact us? Maybe not, 
Will it impact us spiritually and, and in the heavenlies? Of course it will, because we were faithful to do what God called us to do in our places and positions while we did it. That's when we will see it. And so we hope to see those things. So Peter here is issuing basically a straightforward challenge to conform our lives to God's holy standards in light of his coming judgment. Heaven is our real home, and we need to live accordingly. Saints are set apart for God's purpose and should be different, not odd, <laughs> but different than the world. Don't be an odd Christian. I love odd Christians. They're wonderful, you know, to have them in the body of Christ once in a while. But, but we don't want to live that way on a daily basis. And you know what I'm talking about, being odd. You know, where, where everything is, praise the Lord, and they're wearing their, their uh, headphones with loud music so that everybody can hear, and their big crosses carrying their Bibles, and, you know, all this. Is, you're odd. <laughs> you're a little odd. Don't be odd, but be different. Make sure they understand that you pray before you eat, that you seek God, and that you're open to pray for them if they need prayer. Peter said, be godly, or he uses the word godliness. You know, next time you speak with someone, you'll know what this word means, godliness. It comes from the Greek word you, sabamai, which means worship. You means good, means literally good worship. Godliness means you're a good worshiper. You worship God. Your mind is focused on God and the things of God. Your heart desires God and the things of God. And so then your body reaches out to God in worshiping of God. That's godliness. The Greek suggests that it reflects an attitude of one's life to live with the sense of his presence and a desire motivated by love to be pleasing to him in all things and what we do and in what we think. It is an attitude of one's life. Godliness is an attitude. I want to please God. I don't just want to work. I don't want to put in my time and, you know, stick my card into the punch there and say, okay, I'm putting my time. No, I want to please him. I really want to please him. It's like that relationship that you find when you first meet somebody and you just want to please them. You know, that woman, from my perspective, being a man, when I first saw my wife, it's like, wow, my jaw dropped. Something happened in my heart. And I said, that's the one. She's it. And I went all out to do whatever I needed to do to let her know that I liked her. The first time I saw her in school, in junior high, Alvarado in Roland Heights, and she came around the corner and she has this blonde hair, and it, I literally, I, I was at my locker, and it was open, and I looked, and she's coming around the corner, and literally, it looked like a Johnson & Johnson's commercial. I thought, where's the studio? Are they filming something here? Because she just happened to walk in slow motion. Her hair was just blowing in the air, and I was like, I'm in love. I'm in total love there. And from that point on, I did whatever it took to please her, you know, because I loved her so much. That's how we have in relationships on this world. We should have that relationship with God. We're in love with him. We love him with all our hearts. And when we do something that's against his character, his will, we know it displeases him. It hurts us because we have the attitude and the sense of his presence with us. We know he's with us at all times. And we should please him because we know he's here. He extends so much. John MacArthur has an excellent summary on this practical meaning of holiness, conduct, and godliness. He says, holy conduct refers to the action. Godliness refers to the attitude. It's the attitude when it comes to godliness. Holy conduct refers to the way I live my life. Godliness refers to the spirit of reverence within me. You, you know God, and you love him, and you reverence him because he is God and he sits upon the throne. And you know that his character is one of love and mercy and compassion. His will is not to do us harm, but to fulfill his plan in our lives. And when you know him in that manner, if you, if you know him in, in a different manner, uh, one of being mean and, and, and angry, that, that's not our God, by the way. That is not our God at all. Well, wait a minute. What about the Old Testament? No, no, no. You're not reading the Old Testament. You read it again and look at the grace of God that he had, even on the other nations that were judged. 
470 years waiting for them to repent and turn to the Lord. He, he gave the other nations while Israel was in bondage to Egypt. That's patience to me, 470 years. That's, that's more than patient. He waited for generations and generations and generations and generations and generations and generations and generations, generations, generations before finally he said, okay, that's it, judgment. And, and, and even at that, the judgment wasn't as, as total annihilation. You know, it was chastisement to wake him up. Hey, I want you to know I'm God. And, and so he sends the plagues, you know, and then he kills the Pharaoh through, the, through the, uh, the swallowing in the Red Sea and so forth. But he didn't annihilate him. But I tell you what, I'm sure that they spoke about it for hundreds of years <laughs> about the God of how he had grace. Yeah. Now, that's the God we serve. And when you understand that God, you have a reverence for him from within side. He goes on and says, by which I live my life. Holy conduct refers to that which rules my behavior, and godliness refers to that which rules my heart, my heart. Yeah, it's okay to love God with your heart. Yeah, the outward man, yes, but with your heart, it's okay to love God. We should love God with our heart, not just with our mind. And so he is saying that, saying, what kind of person ought you to be in the heart and in behavior, in motive and in action, in attitude and in duty, in heart, motive, and attitude? What kind of person are you? Take a football game. It's not the huddle, but the plays that count, right? You're at a football game, two teams come out. The Raiders, who are zero and six, <laughs> you know, and, and some other team, Cowboys, who are who are winning, and, and you're there to see a game, but you're not there to see the huddle. The job of the church is not to impact the church; it's to impact the world. Does that make sense? We're we're not just to be in church to help us in church and to impact the church and the lives of the church, but to impact the world also. It's like a huddle in a football game. 67,000 people don't pay money for a ticket to watch the Raiders huddle. Oh, wow, look at them huddling. Isn't that a nice huddle? Look at the positioning of the players around there as they're talking. Oh, this is a great huddle. And quarter after quarter, beautiful huddle. I love the huddles. But nothing ever happens with huddles, right? They're just huddles. So it doesn't make any sense. No, 67,000 people paid a ticket to see what... A huddle does in a game. Yeah, they huddle, but then the result of the huddle is a win, is a touchdown, is yardage, and, and so forth. That's the result. And so the church needs to understand that. The challenge for the church is that we don't just huddle on a Sunday morning call, but what is it that we do after the Sunday morning call? How do we impact the world? How do we change the lives of others? How do we make our faith active outside of these walls? What are we doing? Yeah, it's good to have single studies and men's studies and family studies and Wednesday nights and so forth, but what are we doing with it afterwards? But that takes the work of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? <clears throat> it takes the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't do this on your own or in your own strength. I know I can't. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And so he says in the next few verses here, which we will be talking about, my second point, the inward living. Not just the outward, but the inward. And this is the desire that we were talking about, the desire to live for God. That desire, a hunger. <clears throat> we all get hungry. Usually first thing in the morning, some of us don't like to eat in the morning because... Um, uh, our bodies are hibernating, and we don't want to wake them up you know, with food. But some people eat in the morning. The first thing they do is eat. When I wake up in the morning, 5.30, first thing I go do is go straight to the kitchen, and I eat something, about uh, three, 400 calories of food. It gets my furnace going. That's how I maintain my weight is to keep the furnace burning. And so I eat, and by 9.30, my body's saying, I'm hungry, feed me again because the furnace is going and now it needs more food. And so I go and get a snack, a protein bar or a drink of, of protein, something like that, to feed my body. And you have this desire to eat. <laughs> we all know that. 
We get hungry. You go all day, and then all of a sudden your body says, hey, you need to eat. And there's this overwhelming desire to feed yourself. There should be an overwhelming desire to please God, to know God, to love God. The Bible's clear in Isaiah 65, 1. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that did not call by my name. See, we did not seek God. God sought us. I never thought about going and finding who God was. No, God sought me out. And then when that happened, I became born again. You've heard that phrase before, born again. That's the changed life. Every person in this church right now needs to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. There, there's no way around that. A good friend of mine has been here for years and years, no longer here, he, he moved away. But he struggled with that. He goes, I don't remember a time when I was born again. I just have always loved God. And I would tell him, there's a point in your life where you were born again. You have to be born again. That old man has to die. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are made new. There's a point in your life where something died. That old nature passed away. It, it, it just diminished. And this new creation came forth. For me, it was 1987 when Greg Laurie was teaching. And he revealed to me my heart by saying that I was a sinner and I was headed to hell. And I knew it. And when he offered the hope of salvation, I took it and I knew my life changed at that moment. Something changed. I can't explain it, but inside something changed. A switch went on and my eyes were opened and things looked different than what they have ever looked like before. And I went home and told my wife, I'm a Christian now. And she looked at me and almost laughed and said, okay, right, sure, <laughs> whatever, because I was bad. And I had to prove to her that I had changed. And it took a couple of years for her to see, you have changed. You have really changed. I wanted to go to church. That was one thing that changed in my life. I wanted to go to church. I never wanted to go to church growing up. I hated church, especially Catholicism go in there and they'd ask for your money and pass out those little felt bags around and they even had some with long sticks so they make sure they get everybody you know and they pull out their nickels and dimes and quarters and people would give and I just thought that's a place to give your money and they're wasting it because everything is so gold and dark and felt and I don't know I just did not feel fed I felt dead in there and I didn't want to be a part of that I wanted to live my life the way I wanted to so I did not like church but for some reason when that light clicked on I need to be in church. What was that about? And so I went back to church, Catholicism, and I'm sitting there with my Bible open. I'm like, when are you going to teach the Bible? Come on. You know, and they go through the rituals and so forth. No Bible teaching. Finally, the reading of the word. All right. First Peter, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they read the word. And I'm like, all right, get into it. That's it. The reading's done. It just, they just read it. That's why it's called the reading. No real food. No spiritual food. I found Calvary Chapel, and they expositorily, as best they could, taught the Word of God, you know, and I ate it up. I thought, this is it. This is where I want to be, and I have always been in church every Sunday. I've missed a couple here and there for various reasons, but church meant a lot to me. It changed my life, and so I cannot get enough church. I'm in church all the time. That's changed, hasn't it, in our society? Church isn't a big deal anymore with technology. You can now watch Greg Laurie on a screen in Orange County with another couple of thousand people. That's strange to me. Hey, God's using it. Praise God. He uses all things, but that's strange to me. I like to be in church with people and connect with the pastor and elders and various things and be active in the community where I'm at, not just go look at a screen like a drive-in movie theater and then leave you know, type of thing. No, I want to be connected. I want to be in church because I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus now. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Have things become new? Are you born again? And when you're born again, God then reveals to you, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have towards you, the desires, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. 
Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That changed heart that seeks after God, God will fill it and reveal his plan to it. So let's look at, take a look at verse 12 here. And we're going to finish up 13 really quick because it repeats himself. So look for the hastening, the coming of the day of God. Now the word looking there, and we're going to spend a little bit of time there. The word looking there is looking forward to or to wait for something. It's to anticipate some event taking place. It is a inward desire that is given by the Holy Spirit, by the way. Earthly speaking, we can look for events taking place. You know, we pull out our, our iPad and we look at our calendar and we, we know that on Friday the kids are going to have a play, so we're looking forward to the play, and it's a planned event. Uh, we had to write it down. What he's talking about here is having a desire to look for a greater event, a spiritual event to take place. It is a desire that the Holy Spirit gives you within your heart. How many times do we really think about one day the world is coming to an end, the rapture will happen? How many times do we really think about that? If you are a believer, you should think about it quite often. It should actually dictate where you're walking and living your life because you're constantly dwelling upon that day could be today. Uh, Pastor Gary uh, shared a couple of uh, messages a while ago, and he said, I now preach as though this is my last message. And I thought, that's a neat idea to preach that way. So when he gets up to the pulpit, he, he says, this could be the day the Lord comes back, so let me preach with, with all my heart. Yeah. Good way to live, knowing that this could be the last day. And so it's an inward desire that God gives us as believers because we know that the end is coming, and so we want to look for that. And so people get involved into eschatology, right, the, the signs of the end. And we look into those things and find out what's going on. I just read an article about a six-day blackout um, that's, that may be happening in December, uh, an eclipse. And for six days, we're going to have total blackout. NASA proves this day, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, got, I got a little excited, you know, about it. Then I s started looking deeper into it, and it turned out to be a fake article. So you've got to be careful, but you look into these things because you're interested, because God's Spirit ha has moved you that way, because you're interested in spiritual things, the end of the world and what's happening in the lives of people. And then so then you dig deeper and you go, oh, that's fake. Oh, it would have been nice, but it's fake, <laughs> you know, to really show the world God's out there and working. But we're looking. Are you looking? Are you expecting, anticipating the hastening, the coming of the day of God? Now, that day we know will be after the tribulation period. And we talked more in length than that earlier. The present tense indicates that this is one's habit and lifestyle. They continually look for the return of Jesus Christ. Adam Clark said, Only those who walk in holiness, who live a godly and useful life, can contemplate this most awful time with joy. <clears throat> When you have a heart to please God, then you look at this great day of the Lord coming as a time of joy because it's all over. And now we begin the millennium reign with the Lord for a thousand years and then to live on for eternity, for eternity. I think it's Hebrews, or maybe it's, it's James, talks about how life is so short, right? It withers away like the grass. It comes and it goes so quickly. And our lifespan is very small. If you were to draw a line from this wall to that wall, and you would mark a spot on that line, about that width, that's probably our lifespan compared to eternity. That's not a lot of time compared to all of that. And so we need to have that perspective that we're here for a short time. We don't cling to things so tightly. This looking speaks of hoping, doesn't it? It's an inward work of the Holy Spirit that, that gives us a hope for that day when the Lord finally comes back and we get to see him face to face. Pastor Chuck Smith passed away October 3rd of last year and he got to see his Savior face to face. 
Steve Mays passed away this year, October 2nd, and got to see his Savior face to face along with Pastor Chuck. That's the day that we hope for, to finally leave this earth and see our Savior face to face. An inward hope, a living hope that we have. And most, under, most p- people understand that hope, hope as, is not wishful thinking, but hope is in something that will happen. We don't wish it will happen. We know that it will happen. It's not wishful thinking like everything hopefully will work out, but I'm not really sure. I'm just hoping that it will. But no, we know that all things will work out because God said they will all work out for good and he has a plan and a purpose through it all. And we know it and so we hope in him and in those results. This is not what the Bible means by hope, wishful thinking. The biblical definition of hope is confidence. Confidence expectation. The New Testament idea of hope is a recognition that in Christ is found the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. Christ fulfilled them all. All 300 or more of the promises were fulfilled in Jesus alone. And so we can have hope that he is the Messiah. Hope is rooted in faith, in the divine salvation that we have in Christ Jesus, that his death on the cross was enough because he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world and he was pure and perfect and holy without spot or blemish. And we can have hope that it was enough to get us into heaven. It is the future hope of the resurrection of the dead, the redemption of the body. One day when we die, we will be resurrected with Jesus Christ and the hope of the promises of eternal life, the inheritance of the saints, the return of Jesus, the transformation into his likeness and even the salvation of God. And, it, and also simply being in the presence of Christ himself. That's all hope in things that will come. And yet we hope for that day to come. And so we live inwardly with a desire of hope. The inward man, the believer in Christ Jesus who is born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. All things become new. There's a desire. There's a hunger for God to please him. That's the hope that God instills within us. That is what Peter is talking about here. So what manner of life ought you to to live, knowing that the end is coming? Live in hope, the inward man, that born again, and live outwardly for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then Peter repeats himself concerning the surrounding events, because of which the heavens will be dissolved by fire and the elements melt with fervent heat. So he basically repeats himself again, so I, I won't... Um, define those words there let me close what are you made of what are you made of if you're thrown into a fiery furnace how would you respond in faith in trust and in hope would you scream and yell and be in despair what are you made of we need to cultivate the outward man by praying that the inward man desires a personal relationship with Christ. Thus will empower us through the Holy Spirit to endure the fires and trials in life. We will suffer, yes, but we will have joy because it's a fruit of the Spirit in our lives. If you don't know Christ or have a relationship with Christ, you must be born again. Well, how do I do that? You remember when Jesus was on the cross and there were two thieves and both thieves began to mock him. But there came a point where one thief began to realize that this is the Messiah. He had a desire now, a hope to be in heaven, a desire that came through the Holy Spirit. And he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, when I'm in paradise, you will be in paradise with me too. That was it. That was his born-again experience. It was a move of the Holy Spirit in his life. That can happen to you also. But in our situation, we're not on a cross. We're We're not ready to die yet. We're ready to live. And so your born again experience is this way. You're on the road to Damascus, and you're ready to persecute Christians, and God reveals himself to you, and now he asks you to repent from your old life and to live a new life like the Apostle Paul, and begin to serve him. And so for us, it's asking Christ into our hearts, asking him to remove the old man, 
and allow us to live the new life that he has for us, for his glory. Then you are born again. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that is done through prayer, through much prayer. So if you have not done that this morning, then I want to give you that opportunity to do that. Let's bow our heads. If you have never asked Christ, just if you have never asked Christ into your heart, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you need Jesus Christ in your heart and you need to become born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand and put it down. <clears throat> now, if you are a believer, you have asked Christ into your heart, but for some reason you're not living that victorious life. You're not living for Christ. I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to open up your eyes and hearts to him. You don't have to raise your hand. You know who you are. God knows who you are. And I pray for a desire in your heart to be pleasing to him. Let's pray. Father, we all come before you right now, Lord. And we're asking for the same thing, Lord. The same thing that you would want us to ask for, Father. To love your son fully. To have a desire to please him completely. Would you give us that desire, Lord? Would you give us the desire to love you more and to love the world less? To desire the things of God more than the world less? Lord, give us that desire through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, Lord. Would you waken him up, Lord? Help us to respond to his move, Lord. I want to love you, Lord. You have loved us so much, Lord. You have done so much for us, Lord. Dying on the cross, Lord. Shedding your blood. Giving us a new life. Please, Lord, give us that desire, Lord, in these last days. Let us be different. Let us be even different than the Christians that we know, Lord. Let, us, let our lives reflect our relationship with you, Lord. Please, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, we're praying this, Lord. In a fresh and a new way, Lord. Through your power your strength, Lord. Fall upon us now, Lord. As you did in the Old Testament with your Shekinah glory, Lord, the presence of God. So fall upon us, Lord, afresh and anew with the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and around us and upon us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name with all our hearts, Lord. Amen.